presents Start Our Set. SOS, the live Friday night program to help you and your family start your Sabbath off right. You've had a tough week, and now it's time to relax and spend time with God's people from all around the world. That's why Wes and Nancy White invite you into their living room to relax and enjoy life. And as always, we'll have lively <laughs> Bible topics and we'll examine current events. Your input is welcome. We want you to talk to us in our chat room. We want to hear your comments and your questions. So get your dinner and your Bible ready for tonight's show. I'm your announcer, Gary Gibbons. We're here in our studios in Big Sandy, Texas. And here is your host for Start Our Sabbath, Wes White. And his beautiful sidekick, Nancy. Is that a fact? <laughs> Good evening and welcome to our 59th show of Start Our Sabbath. Wow, I think our new motto should be, for the best in employment TV, join us on SOS. Hey, that's good. I like that. Let's do that. Okay. This is a show where we try to promote sound Christian principles that are valuable today as well as 50 years from now or even maybe 100 years yeah. from now. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that. Over this past week, I have been perusing Ron Dart's Bible. I think I've mentioned on this show that this Bible was willed to me after Ron and Allie both passed away. And when I look at the, the, the handwritten marginal notes in this Bible, I'm always struck by the timeliness of Ron Dart's wisdom. Yeah. Uh, that's an important point. You know, Ron was one of the best teachers we've had in the church over the past 100 years or so. Now, Wes, over the next several, several months, aren't you and the people at the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association going to try and start promoting some of Ron's work? That's teachings? right, we are. And, and let's be clear. We are never going to say that Ron's preachings and writings are on par with the scripture. No. Instead, what we're saying is that Ron's preachings and writings were head and shoulders above the vast majority of the teachings of his contemporaries. That's right. Ron's materials are timeless. Right. And timeless is the key word. Now, on SOS, we try to emulate Ron in that regard. I mean, our identity in this ministry is the gospel of Jesus and the law of God. And when we make these two things the centrality of our message, then God's love is going to prevail in everything that we do. When we make these two things the centrality of our message, it's really hard to go wrong. Some of the stuff that preachers out there today have these, uh, out there these days, it's really kind of a bunch of nonsense. They get away from the trunk of the tree. They get off onto stupid, twiggy stuff. The trunk of the tree is the gospel of Jesus and the law of God both of which create agape love within the ecclesia. Right, so we try to stay out of the twigs and close to the trunk of the tree. Correct. Our desire, as Nancy said, is to promote teachings that 50 or 100 years from now, people are, are not going to look at later and say, wow, look at this nonsense they used to teach decades ago on that old show, SOS. We don't want future generations to say, well, you know, subsequent events have proven SOS's teachings to be really wrong. Yeah, we hope that 50 or 100 years from now, people are going to look at what we taught on SOS and say, hey, SOS was different than a lot of the ministries in that time period because SOS's teaching are still relevant today, 100 years later. Yeah. We want future Christians to look at our teachings and say there's still value in what they taught way back then. Okay, yeah, and again, this is one of the legacies of Rod Dart. And again, this is a lesson that Nancy and Bill and I have learned from that wise man. And all right, now it's time for me to go into a rant. And, and it's time for Steve to say, oh, here he goes again. <laughs> right, Steve? Oh, and speaking of Steve, um, uh, I got a note from Steve. He said that, you know, on a previous show when I was doing it alone, I was up in somewhere in the Midwest on my way to Wisconsin, and I was doing the show alone because I don't know how to bring Bill and Nancy on, so I did it by myself, and I said, I really don't like doing the show all by myself. And Steve wrote in, and he said, we like it even less than you do. <laughs> we want Nancy back. Okay. <clears throat> so Steve, well, I'm here tonight. You're here, and you were here last week. So, yeah. no, so anyway, um, here, here goes my rant. In this boat that we call the Ecclesia, you are not a passenger. You're a crew. There are no passengers within the body of Christ. Everyone is a crew member. We've all got work to do. Now, some people try to stop you from doing good works like personal evangelism. They say, ooh, personal evangelism, that's the job for the ministry. 
No, evangelism is everybody's job. Again, you're not a passenger. You can't just sit back and watch the leaders do the work. You're a crew member. And while your job may not be evangelism per, per se, you do have the job at a minimum of letting your light shine so that you might glorify God. And all this ties in with what we always teach on this show. You're getting tired of me saying it. You got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And some church people don't want all these Christian responsibilities on their shoulders. They want to just go to services for a couple hours, then go home, and then go back to living their regular lives that have no hint of Christianity involved. And, and if that's what you want, tough. You don't get to do that. Instead, it's up to you to contribute good works towards the gospel of Jesus. It's up to you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So remember, no passengers in the ecclesia. All of us are crew members. All right. You said it straight. Now let's see if we can get Wes's blood pressure down a little bit by switching gears. Wes, we're both back from our travels over the past two weeks. You visited people in Missouri, blood Illinois, pressure. and Wisconsin. Yeah. What are you doing? You're checking my blood pressure. You said you want to get it. <laughs> All right, you visited people in Missouri, Illinois, and Wisconsin. <laughs> I've been to Denver, Chicago, and Boston. Yeah. Isn't it nice to be home? Uh, it's great to be back home. I really mean that. I mean, traveling is exhausting. And I, I've decided I am never going to leave Big Sandy, Texas again for the rest of my life. Not yeah. going to happen. Well, you say that now, but you've got responsibilities. You've got to get back out on the road. If for no other reason, then you need to start filming some episodes of Answers for the 21st Century Thinker. Yeah, you're right. Oh, and, and by the way, did you check out the new intro and the new outro for our new upcoming series, 21 CT? 21 CT? Yeah, that's our new shorthand for Answers for the 21st Century Thinker, 21 C. Bill because thought of that. Because we must have acronyms. We must have church. acronyms. Bill <laughs> came up with that. All right. If, if you go to our, our uh, Facebook page and watch the intro and the outro, they're really short, like, you know, maybe 20 seconds. You're going to love them. Terry Lussenheide, Lussenheide and Gary Gibbons put together a great intro and a great outro for 21CT. And, again, you can find them on my Facebook page, DCM Facebook page, RLDEA Facebook page. So, yeah, you're right, Nancy. I, I need to hit the road again and start filming, but... Right now, any thought of traveling is just so unappealing. I'm so glad to be home. Like yesterday, Nancy and I got a bunch of advertisements in the mail to go to Disney World, and I just have no desire to leave our beautiful three acres and go all the way down to Disney World. Don't Come do on, Wes, let's go to Disney World. I'm up for it. <sighs> Welcome to my world, right? Okay, now get this. Disney World just announced that they are now serving alcohol at every restaurant in Magic Kingdom. Alcohol, really? Yeah, so now when parents will say to their kids, hey, these giant teacups are spinning too fast, the kids will be like, Dad, we're not even on the ride yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because Disney World is now serving alcohol, I think they need to change their slogan. Really? Right now, Disney's slogan is, this is the happiest place on earth. That's good. Well, I think they need to change their logo to Disney World when you wish upon a bar. Oh, oh Wes. <laughs> I mean it. Why, I mean, why do they need booze at Disney World? It's a family place. What next? Disney World. Watch Anna and Elsa do the walk of shame. <laughs> oh, oh, I think that's quite enough. How about this? Disney World, official home of the $40 Bud Light. <laughs> at least 40 Okay. We're moving on for this topic. In spite of Wes's grousing, we've got a great show yeah, tonight. It's good. Father's Day is coming up. Uh, Sunday, and Bill is going to talk about being an honorable father. Nancy's going to talk about, I need someone older and wiser. Yeah, Wes is older, but... Eh. And Wes is going to talk about the Louisiana per Purchase. And how it relates to hypocrisy. All right. Once again, we've got to send out a big thank you to Carl Nocktree out in North Carolina, who's handling our technical stuff. And Carl is now building our new RLDEA.com website. Thank you, Carl, for all the great stuff that you do. Yeah, thank you. Before we go into our opening prayer, we want to mention some quick prayer requests. And would you please uh, write these following prayer requests down and add them to your list? Yes, please. First, there's my buddy Richard Brass. He lives in Florida. I've known Richard since I was like 12 years old. Richard underwent heart surgery this week, and he's now in recovery. He's doing better but he's asking for your prayers, so please pray for Rich Brass. Also, we want to mention Nadine Freeze. Many of you out there know Randy Freeze. Randy has a terrific Facebook page called The Hope of Israel. It's a great page. If you haven't checked it out, we hope you will. It's really good, The Hope of Israel. 
Anyway, Randy and his wife Nadine are expecting and there are some complications with blood clotting, so please put forth prayers for a safe and healthy delivery for Nadine and Randy's baby. That's right, and we want to ask for prayers for, our, for a fellow who's named Marty. Yeah, let me explain about Marty. Marty lives next door to the church building of the Church of God Seventh Day here in Tyler, Texas. Uh, Marty's mom has Alzheimer's, and uh, you know how tough it can be to take care, excuse me, take care of relatives who have serious illnesses. So please pay, pray for Marty and his mom. All right, well, will you please bow your heads out there before, as we go before our Creator in prayer. Our Father in heaven, once again, we are so grateful to you for Jesus Christ who sits at your right hand. Father, we thank you that Jesus died for our sins so that we might have eternal life, but also he was beaten and by his stripes we were healed so we can come before you and ask for your blessing in the area of healing. We ask for the healing of Nadine, for Richard, and for um, uh, Marty's mom who has Alzheimer's. We ask for your mercy on them. We ask for you to bless the caregivers because so many times the job of caregiving is just as difficult, if not more so, than the person who's ill. Now, Father, we are so grateful to be able to fellowship with you tonight. We uh, thank you for your obedient ones in the ecclesia who are participating in the show tonight. We ask now for your blessing on the show. Please be with us in everything that we say and do. Help us to have love in our hearts. Help us to have obedience for you. Help us to do all things in a way that's pleasing to you. We ask this and give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Nancy, anything going on in the chat room? Oh, we've got lots of people tonight? joining us tonight. Ron Griffin, Judy McCarty, Roger Martin, Bob Petty, Deborah Dial, Bill and Terry Lucenhide, Carl and Mimi, Willow Love Al from Columbia, South Carolina, Richard Maxwell, uh, Maxwell from Rocky Ridge, Maryland, Good. Forced Overmike from Kinley, who said he's just back from, where was he, Africa, somewhere, Europe, oh, Germany, that's where he said. Um, uh, Amy Hohertz is with us and, and says happy Sabbath. Uh, Jen <coughs> Tarter from Kansas. Uh, Jody uh, Hicka, Hicks, I'm sorry. Jason Sadler and Paul Shaw. Dan Krantz. Uh, Ed Lambino says have a good Sabbath. Wayne Weiss is watching. David Lind. And Sharon Lewis is watching. Oh, good. good Melissa crowd. James. Uh, Sharon Lewis is in Toronto, so usually she's in Jamaica. She yeah, what are you doing? In, in, uh, write to us and let us know what you're doing in Toronto. Is there something going on there? Okay. Yeah. Alicia Monroe Prime is with us. Um, Rod Kuzman says, hey, Wes, someone hijacked your show, or so it seems. What do you mean? Your mic. Me? It's your mic a little bit closer. Yeah. You mean I hijacked your I don't know. Oh, uh, James Michael Marinek is with us. Did I say Rod Kuz? Oh, yeah, he's one. Tammy Brown Gilbert. Wow, good crowd tonight. Anita Miller. Uh, uh, Alicia Monroe Prime says she's in Nova Scotia. Oh, I love Nova Scotia. I love the maritime provinces. All right. Xavier St. Hope says honorable Sabbath to us. Reed Harding Bradwell says Shabbat Shalom. Are you allowed to say that on You're the You're allowed show? to say that on uh, SOS. <laughs> Verge Cordell is with us. Michael McCarty's with us. Um, Benita Miller is at uh, Choke. Chaka Whitney, North Carolina. Okay. Chocolate Whit Whitney. Yeah. Or Vanilla Whitney. <laughs> we don't know. What Michael Thelman uh, is with us. Uh, let's see. I think that's uh, that's it for everyone. Robert Ridge is with us from Westminster, Maryland. Okay. Uh, Ed Joy Gonzalez uh, Palumbo are from New Orleans. Uh, Deborah Costa Borges is from Palm Coast, Florida. Man. Hey, the competitor of my company is in Palm Coast. Palm Coast, but Do you we work still for like PCD fulfillment. Yeah, but we still um, like. Oh, uh, uh, we yeah, we Palm love Coast Florida. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, Rod is from Frederick, says Richard Maxwell. Okay, all that's right. Great. So that's it in the. In the chat room in YouTube. Uh, Let's get to YouTube's later. Go ahead and do your presentation. Let's keep moving here. Okay. We'll come back to that. All right. Take the wheel. You got your wheel ready? Do I? Turn oh, it on. Is it on? Oh, man. I got to do everything. technical problem. There we go. There we go. All right. Let's see. Oh, look at that. I was watching part of the Sound of Music on TV not long ago, and I had a yelling at the TV moment, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Liesl, the eldest Von Trapp daughter, and her boyfriend, Rolf, were singing 16 Going on 17. Maybe you know the song. Mm -hmm. And Lisa sings, I need someone older and wiser telling me what to do. 
You're 17 going on 18. I'll depend on you. What? <laughs> the last person a 16-year-old girl needs telling her what to do is a 17-year-old boy. And yes, I actually yelled at the screen, are you crazy? <laughs> now, the Bible clearly spells out the need for wise counsel and a variety of it. Proverbs 11:14 says, where no counsel is, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Mm. And Proverbs 15:22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many av uh, advisors, they succeed. So counsel is a necessary part of a Christian's life. Uh, Christian counsel is, a vi is vital in our walk with God, but not all counsel is equal. Wait, wait, wait. Please forgive me for interrupting. Would you please repeat that last phrase? Gladly. Not all counsel is equal. Yes, amen. Thank you. I, I hope y'all wrote that down. Okay. Good. When seeking advice, it's so tempting to go to my friends who I know feel the same way that I do, knowing that they're going to rubber stamp my own thoughts on what I should do. It can be tempting to only speak to that person who will hear me out and say, you do what you think is best. We all have those yes-men friends in our lives. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think that's the message that Pro the book of Proverbs is trying to give us. The example of Rehoboam is a perfect cautionary tale regarding seeking wise counsel. We find this story in 1 Kings 12. After he's named king, the people come to Rehoboam and ask him for relief from the heavy yoke that Solomon had put upon them. He taxed the people pretty hard yep, to them build to the temple. Yep. Yeah. Rehoboam first consulted with the elders who'd been there for his father. These seasoned, advi seasoned advisors told Rehoboam to be the servant of the people, to lighten the people's load. These advisors said it would seal his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Well, 1 Kings t uh, 12, 8 through 11 tells us what happened next. Uh, he, but he abandoned, now I'm quoting from the scripture, but he abandoned the counsel that the old man gave him and took counsel with the young man who gr he had grown up with and stood before him. And he said to them, what do you advise that we answer the people um, who have said to me, lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had all grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made us our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My people, my little finger, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older and wiser counselors in favor of advice from uh, people who had grown up as his buddies, the guys, you know, that he'd been around with all his life. The result was disastrous. Rehoboam lost most of the kingdom to Jeroboam. Rehoboam took the counsel that appealed to his vanity and came from guys just like him. We too can be tempted to take counsel only from those who agree with us already. But we need to be careful and avoid this pitfall. If you don't know where to start looking for wise counsel, I've got good news for you. Jesus is named our counselor before even his human birth. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us, For unto us his child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We can begin by seeking uh, Jesus' advice, his counsel, including asking him to lead us to wise counsel in the Bible. Uh, scriptures that will direct us to lead us to wise counselors in the church and to give us a heart to listen to the hard things we may need to hear. Remember the fairy tale of the emperor's new clothes? His, quote, friends, unquote, were willing to let him run around naked to save their own pride. It took a humble, honest child to give it to him straight. We all need people around us who will be frank and honest with us. Um, those who, we can say, who can say those hard things to us because we've built a relationship with them over time and because they truly want what's best for us. If you're really blessed, your mate is someone who you can trust to be frank and honest and give, to give it to you straight, but with love. There are times to seek professional counsel as well for marital issues, addiction concerns, big purchases, a career change, child rearing advice, and many other issues. Wes and I often seek counsel with each other on important life matters. 
We also pray for wisdom and guidance on these things. We'll go to a lawyer or a CPA when appropriate and have sought, sought ministerial counsel on certain matters. <coughs> Far too often, we seek people, friends, brothers in Christ, family, who, who's, um, who suffer because we don't seek wise counsel. So that's sometimes not only uh, something we see that happens in this life, but don't let it happen to you. God alone is the only one who doesn't need advice. His own counsel is enough. Romans 11, 33-34 says, Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? But as for the rest of us, we need to seek counsel from those who are truly older and wiser on a specific matter or in life in general. Let's try not to go with the example of Liesel or Rehoboam. I'd love to hear your thoughts too. You can write me at Dynamic Christian Ministry. Oh, Nancy at Dynamic Christian Ministries dot org. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see. Uh, would you like to real quick go into the YouTube and then you can go get Bill? Okay. So in the YouTube we have Rick Four who says Shabbat Shalom, and um, Bill is there uh, doing double duty. So we have Mimi and Carl. So we've got quite a few people there. There was somebody. Trudy Cranford is with us there and. Sends out hugs to at least Mimi, hopefully all of us. Ben is with us, and I think that's it. For well, the, oh, Robert Murphy is with us too. So that's okay. it for YouTube. We got about 17 people watching there, and we're glad you're with us tonight. So Great I'm going to go tonight. get uh, Bill. Go get Bill. Okay. While uh, Nancy's uh, getting Bill, I just want to give you a reminder. At SOS, we never ask you for money. We don't want your money. Um, uh, again, last week I had a couple offers for people that wanted to send us money to help us at Dynamic Christian Ministries and SOS. And I always got to put the brakes on it and say, no, we don't want your money. So please don't even think about giving us your money. We don't want it. But we do want something from you. And you know what those two things are. What are those two things that we want from you? First of all, we want your prayers. Uh, having uh, you in our prayers is very, uh, uh, having us in your prayers is very, very important. So please. Um, put us in your prayers that God will guide and direct everything that we do on this show. We are a praying group. We believe in prayer, and we need your prayers. And the second thing we ask you is, please hit the share button. If you don't feel guilty by if it's on your heart to push the share button, because when you hit the share button, you're helping us tremendously. You're getting the message out. And I think we've got Bill on uh, the line right now. It was a rousing success. Um, and I want to remind you to check out uh, our Facebook group called Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. This group was created by our good friend Bill, and we re recommend you follow this page. It has currently over 17,000 Facebook followers. Wow. So I think you're going to find it uh, worthwhile. Again, that's Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. Good evening, Bill. Are you there? Yeah. Hey, Wes, I'm here, and it's great to be with the. Uh... You and Nancy, great to be with all of you, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, watching here at Start Our Sabbath. We're broadcasting yes. to you live, live from the top floor of the building of our West Coast studios here for Start Our Sabbath. Is that where you are, our West Coast studios? We love uh, that. And the top floor, by the way, not just top floor. Good. I hope you had a good week out there in beautiful Southern California. Oh, we did. Uh, the weather's been beautiful. We went to a little concert up in the mountains in the Pines last night, had an enjoyable time. And the weather has been great. Great to be with you. Good. What have you got for us tonight, my brother? Well, Wes, thank you. We're going to talk about honoring your, your father and your mother. It's the first commandment with promise. Do you remember that in the Ten Commandments? And the Bible shows us reasons to honor our fathers as well as our spiritual father in heaven. Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise. Honor your uh, mother and father, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, is a commandment today that I'm going to focus on, the first part, that we're supposed to honor, and just what is an honorable father, and how do we do it, and how do we do it? Now, a lot of things I have to say would certainly go along with honoring your mother also, but since Sunday is Father's Day, I thought it would be appropriate to give a message talking about fathers, and how to be an honorable father as well. Now, we may not have a dad. You may have had a weak or a missing father figure. We all had a father, or we wouldn't be here, of course. But there's one thing that we share in common. We all do have a father. 
However, I know there's been fathers that probably some would just as soon forget. So please don't think I'm trying to force something here where fathers who've been abusive or have been hurtful to their children or forgotten them or abandoned them. I'm familiar with the pain of this that can cause people, trust me. But realize that your father in heaven, he's always there. He loves you and he cares about you deeply. So don't ever let a failed human get in that way of this special relationship that we can enjoy with God, our Father. Why should we honor our fathers anyway? What is there to honor about a father? Why should we even pay attention? Why would we even care to honor our fathers? What is there to honor? How can we as fathers be more honorable? You know, it's interesting. Matthew 19, verse 29 says this. Everyone who has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or a mother or a wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit lasting life. Friends, we're called to be the missing family members for our brethren at times. We're called to be the fathers and the mothers and the sisters and the brothers. Church is not just a social club. It's a family. And should be a family. We need to be fathers to one another, those of us that are men. The late Ron Dart was a person like that in my life. Now, Ron Dart, for those who are not familiar with the name, he was a, a Sabbatarian minister, had a radio ministry uh, across many, many states. And he was an evangelist who, in my opinion, and those of many others, was the best Bible teacher of our times. But beyond that, he was a father fig figure for me. He was a very dear friend that I could talk to honestly. I could be myself. I could confess my faults. And I always was thankful for his advice, his opinion, and his observations. He was a true pillar in my life, and I am very thankful for him. He has passed away here, but he lives on. And I know one thing Wes and Nancy and, and myself want to do, and several of you do too, is to carry on the legacy of Ron Dart and his wisdom and his leadership and frankly, being a good father to us too. So I want to address seven traits of an honorable dad, seven traits that you can use for helping your own children or those that are church that need that father figure. Point one is realize that your manhood and fatherhood are directly tied to your relationship with God. So that means you need to be spending time in God's word. You need to be communing with God the Father. You need to have time in prayer. Make that time. You need to have time to be with God's people and to be an essential part of their lives. Again, church is not just a social club, not just something you check the box and go home. You're there to create godly relationships. Point two, if you're married, you've got to uphold your wife as your number one friend and co-worker in life. I know Nancy just uh, checked, uh, t spoke on that a minute ago. We must realize that loving our wives is one of the greatest things that we can ever give to our kids. And realize your kids are going to learn how to have that relationship with their spouse someday is going to mirror very similar to what you're exemplifying now. And you've got to protect your marriage. It's the best gift you could ever give your kids and your spouse. Protect your marriage like it's your very life. Next point. Practice the discipline of meekness. Exemplify the combination of humility, but also with strength. You need to be strong for your families, but not strong at your family. Great dads are going to get this idea. So in home, yelling and abuse of any kind should be avoided at all costs. We're warned in scriptures, do not drive your children to wrath. Do not drive your children to wrath. Keep that always forefront in your thoughts and dealing with your children, with your teenagers, even your adult children. Point four, tie your hearts to the hearts of your children. There's a very special God-given bond that we should cherish and cultivate on a daily basis. It means always looking to create that heart moment with our children. So when we touch them, we touch their souls, we touch their hearts especially when it comes to sharing God's love and the truth with them. Try to relate it to them. Try to touch them. Point five, be a great listener. Make yourselves available for those special walking by the way teaching moments 
and those conversations with your children. In Deuteron Deuteronomy 6, is verse 5 through 7, it talks about when you walk the way, where you're walking or you're hiking, you're going for a stroll, you're going on a lake, you're out fishing, you're out hunting, you're driving in the car. A lot of times that's when we have a lot of time together is in that car. Hey, talk about life. Talk about God. And it's one of those areas of lives that, of our lives we need to be constantly on our radar. And as I've found multiple times, those heartstring moments with my kids often will just happen naturally. Not to say that we can't plan an, int an intentional one-on-one -on -one from time to time with our children. But it never fails that our children want to be engaged at times we are planning on doing something else. We're at a house project or we need to go to bed. So I'll say this. Dads that are nailing us are, have never regretted the time they've taken to listen to the hearts of their kids. And as a matter of fact, this is likely one of the biggest reasons they connect so well with their kids. Is they're willing to take time out of something that's important to give it to their children. They, and dads that are successful have invested the time to truly get to know the hearts and the souls of their children. Point six, make your children feel special and believe in them. Believe in their dreams. Believe in, in how they're, uh, things they want to accomplish within reason, of course, but be their biggest fan. And I thought this quote by the late Jim Volvano, the famous college basketball coach over at North Carolina, and, and what he said I thought was very fitting. He said, quote, my father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give another person. He believed in me. So make sure you do this. You know, God the Father, he believes in us. He believed in us to give us a calling, right? While we were yet sinners, we need to believe in our kids too. Great dads will believe in their kids and let their kids know just how special they really are. And perhaps the most important point about being an honorable dad is that mercy and grace are a part of their household. And mercy and grace is a very important part with our spiritual father in heaven as well. Because as sinners and as men, we know that we're always going to be dealing with offenses and trip-ups. And this makes mercy and grace two of our strongest relationship allies. A saying to remember is this, forgiven and forgiving. You've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. And we must make sure we are forgiving and pass that on. And in this regards, take the lead in admitting when we're wrong and asking for forgiveness. And don't ever underestimate how powerful and important that this is, asking for forgiveness and being forgiving and kind to others. So listen, I'm a big, ugly guy, am I not? Right? So I can say this at you without you looking kind of sideways at me or thinking I'm a little strange, right? But listen, Love matters. Love really matters. John 3.16, for God, God the Father, so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Again, remember the sacrifice of our Father in heaven that he did. His Son he's had for all eternity and willing to subject him and in sacrifice to cover our sins, the things we did. In conclusion here, may all of you have a wonderful and blessed Father's Day. Remember that we have the role of being a father, whether we have children or not, in the brotherhood of our family and in, in the ecclesia. And may all of us be honorable mothers, yes, and fathers too. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Bill, i got to take exception with one thing you okay. said, if you sure. don't mind. You said you're a big, ugly guy. Well, you're a big guy, but you're not ugly. You, you're beautiful. And Nancy and I appreciate everything that you do and everything that uh, your beautiful wife, Terry, does. So thank you so much for your hard work. And um, you have a great Sabbath, okay? Listen, I, uh, Terry and I have great love for you guys. You've been very good friends to us. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share with our brothers and sisters here on Starter Sabbath. Wonderful. God bless God you. God bless you. I'll talk to you after the show. All right, okay? my friend. Take care. Okay, cool. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have Nancy come back and uh, we'll check out what's in the uh, chat room. But first, uh, let's move on to our third segment for tonight. Let's talk about, oops, let's get the picture up here. Let's, let's talk about the Louisiana. 
I believe that looking at this subject can lead us into some lessons, some lessons that can be very valuable for us in the ecclesia today. Now, Nancy, right now, she's thinking, oh, let me guess, you're going to talk about history. And it's like, uh, <laughs> And if I can get back here, I would say that. <laughs> and I you're say, going correct to talk about history. And I say, correct mundo, go to the front of the class, uh, young lady. Who would have ever guessed it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, um, who would have guessed it? Anyway, in 1803, Pre uh, President Thomas Jefferson's representatives arranged for the United States to purchase from France the entire territory of Louisiana. And this was an earth-shattering event for a lot of reasons. The first is that the Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States. Previous to the Louisiana Purchase, the United States was just a collection of former British colonies hugging the Atlantic coast, and they couldn't even get along with each other. They were always squabbling. Because of the Louisiana Purchase, the United States became the sole owner of the vital waterway called the Mississippi River and obtained immediate access to the Gulf of Mexico. The Louisiana Purchase also gave the United States a giant step toward becoming a nation that eventually would go from ocean to ocean, from coast to coast. But that's old news. Every kid in the eighth grade history class knows this stuff. But here's the forgotten part of history, that the Louisiana Purchase turned out to be a major seismic shift for the American political situation. Let me explain. At this time in history, the United States had two political parties. First, there were the Federalists who said that the United States Constitution was a flexible document and it gave the federal government all kinds of implied powers to do great things for the country. And this was the party of Washington and Adams. Then there was the Democratic Republican Party and this party included guys who each later became President Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. And Jefferson's party said there were no implied powers in the Constitution. They said that the only powers that the federal government had were those that were explicitly and clearly stated in the words of the Constitution. But because of the Louisiana Purchase, the two parties immediately switched positions. Both parties did a complete flip-flop on this important constitutional matter. And here's how this happened. When the Federalists found out that Jefferson had bought Louisiana from France, the Federalists were fearful of the success of this endeavor. They were afraid that the purchase would make Jefferson really powerful and popular with the public. So the, the, Jeff the Federalists felt they had to stop it. So they said, they said, there's absolutely nothing written in the Constitution that allows the U.S. government to buy land from another country. Therefore, they said, the Louisiana Purchase is unconstitutional. This was totally the opposite of what they had been saying for years. On the other side, Jefferson's party did the same thing. They responded with, well, it's all right if the U.S. buys this land from France. They said purchasing land from foreign governments is implied in the Constitution. Again, totally opposite of, about what they had been saying for years. Again, each took a new stance that was totally opposite to their previous position of just a few months prior. For expediency's sake, each party abandoned its principles and completely reverse course. Why? Well, it's simple. The Democratic Republican Party wanted the Louisiana Purchase to succeed, and the Federalists wanted the Purchase to fail. It was all for political reasons. And this is so typical of a politician. Plain and simple hypocrisy. Now, I know that my pointing this out to you is going to break the hearts of some people out there. Or it may infuriate you that I'm speaking blasphemy against the Founding Fathers because a lot of you think that the Founding Fathers of this country were these demagogues, demigods who could virtually do no wrong. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that these men were flawed. Just like politicians today are flawed. None of these people are perfect any more than any of us who produce the show are perfect. Nancy and Bill and I, we are not per perfect. If you want perfection, you're only going to find it in Jesus. Now, does this statement that I make about the Founding Fathers, does it suggest that imperfections in human leaders means that they're evil people? Do these imperfections somehow negate their great accomplishments? Of course not. Pointing out the faults of the Founding Fathers and in contemporary politicians means none of that. Our pointing out human imperfections in leaders simply illustrates that they're not perfect, nothing more, nothing less. So 
please don't get yourself all bent out of shape when I tell you some about some human leader who does something wrong, whether we're talking about uh, histor uh, guys in history or secular politicians today or Christian preachers today. Is that asking too much? Are you mature enough to handle this? Or, or are you that fragile in your adoration of those you look up to for leadership? Here are some recent examples of political party hypocrisy in this country. Back when Bill Clinton was president, his fellow Democrats would acknowledge his extramarital immorality and they would say, we don't care about the morals of the president because we just want a good leader. Remember that? That, that, was, that was out there. I remember. Yeah. Then the Republicans would say, they'd counter that with, no, 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 no. Morals are important because we need our president to be a moral person. Today, these two political parties have completely reversed their positions on the issue of morality when it comes to the president. Now that pre Trump is president, the Republicans acknowledge his extramarital actions and they say, well, we don't care about the morals of the president because we just need a good leader. And the Democrats are now saying, no, 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 morals are important because we need our president to be a moral person. This is a complete reversal of their stances on immorality. And this is hypocrisy. And again, what we're doing today, it only mirrors the hypocrisy that we saw with the Federalists and with the Democratic Republicans back in 1803. All right, here's another example. Not long ago, we had a situation where Obama established relations with Cuba. The Republicans were against it. They said, well, the Castro brothers are communist dictators and we have no business becoming friendly with that communist country. Well, today, Trump is trying to establish relations with North Korea and it's the Democrats' turn to be the naysayers. The Democrats are now saying that North Korea is run by a communist dictator and that we have no business becoming friendly with that communist country. This is the same argument that Republicans used against the Democrats with Cuba. Once again, each party has totally reversed its position on dealing with communist dictators. Again, it's all for expediency and it's all hypocrisy. And I want you to understand that all of this that I'm saying tonight, it's coming from a guy who used to be a Democrat in the 60s and who used to be a Republican in the 70s. And most of you know that now I'm no longer involved in politics. I haven't voted since 1980. That was the last time I voted. I don't vote anymore. And I'm not telling you not to vote. If you feel the need to vote, go vote. I'm just telling you my personal position on politics so you know where I'm coming from in all of this. I'm not taking sides. I only bring this up because I want to make it clear that on this show, I don't take sides in any of this secular political stuff. So you know that anything I say on this show is not because I need to defend the actions of my political party that I've gone on record as endorsing because I don't have a political party. And we're now at the point where the rubber meets the road for us in the ecclesia tonight. Here's where we can now bottom line this discussion. <clears throat> I've always promised you that on this show, you're not gonna see us take any doctrinal stances because of political reasons. And by that I mean two things. First, our teachings are not based on the political parties in the United States. And second, and actually more importantly, our teachings are not based on the internal church politics of some religious organization. Because when a minister preaches a doctrine that's based on the internal church politics of a church organization, too many times, that's a form of hypocrisy. Now let me explain. Over the past month or so, we've been talking about the end times and headline theology. And don't worry, we're not going to get into that tonight. We're done with Finally. that. <laughs> Finally, we've moved on. And if you want to see what we talked about, go back to episodes, uh, SOS episodes 56, 57, and 58, maybe even 55. I can't remember. So we're done with that. But I got to tell you that over this past week, we've gotten some really interesting reactions to these shows from all over the place. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff we're, that we've gotten. And, and I'm not complaining. I'm glad. I'm always glad for feedback. Things have taken place that I think we can learn from in the church. And, and, and I think that this is all good because it's a teachable moment. For example, there has been, uh, there has been some, how, do I, how should I phrase this, 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> okay, there's been some weeping and gnashing of teeth by some people about what we presented regarding the end times and headline theology in those previous shows. Mm -hmm. Some folks have gotten livid with me. I mean, really, really angry. And, and please understand, and I, I say this sincerely, it's fine if someone gets mad and disagrees with me. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. Here's where the problem is. There are ministers in church organizations who actually agree with me on what I've been teaching on this subject over the past month. They agree with me, but they can't publicly admit their agreement with me because it would cause them to get into trouble within their organizations. And in fact, let me make really, really clear a, a point here. But, but before I get into this point, hang in there. I want to set a strict ground rule regarding this next point I'm about to make. After I make this next statement, do not ask me in the chat room where I got this teaching from. Further, no speculation in the chat room as to who might have taught me this. I don't want to start some fight within some church organization out there. Heaven knows these church organizations have enough problems. Let's not add to their difficulties, okay? What they do in those church organizations, their politics, their teaching, it's none of my business. I'm here to just help you to understand the Bible to the best of my ability. So Carl, Bill, and Nancy, listen up. If some person starts speculating in the chat room about this next point that I'm about to make, please delete the comment. Okay. Don't kick them out of the chat room, just delete the comment. All right, check this out. I didn't come up with these teachings about headline theology being bunk. I didn't come up with that by myself. I learned these things from ministers in some of the church organizations out there Church organizations where headline theology is taught. Did you get that? I'm admitting I wasn't smart enough to figure out this headline theology thing all by myself. This understanding was actually taught to me. So again, this thing about headline theology being a bust is not a concept that originated with, with Wes. I got it from ministers and some of the church organizations out there that teach it. Again, we absolutely do not need to speculate at this point in the chat room. And if you do, Bill and Carl and Nancy, please delete the comment. Now, I'm gonna to try to be really kind on this. While I sympathize with these ministers who don't wanna lose their paychecks or their positions by being open about what they see as the uselessness of headline theology, I sympathize with them that they don't wanna start civil wars in their church organizations over this. I, I, I get that. And while I sympathize with them, I have to be frank and say as kindly and as gently and as lovingly as I can, this action is a form of hypocrisy. And, I, and I'm not telling them that they need to change. What they do in their church organizations is none of my business. But it is an act of hypocrisy. And I really, really feel bad saying this, and I'm not trying to badmouth these guys. I love these guys. And I don't want their lives to become miserable which is exactly what's going to happen if they ever come out and admit that what their church teaches regarding end, time, uh, you know, end times and the headline theology, they're going to be miserable if they ever come out and say, this is a bunch of silliness. And, and please notice, no, no, this is important, please notice that I didn't call these under-the-radar ministers hypocrites. I didn't call them names. I said their actions were hypocritical. And there's a difference because... While we on SOS condemn teachings and doctrines and actions, we never condemn the person. Let me say that again. On SOS, we condemn teachings, doctrines, and actions, but we never condemn the person. All right, let's move on. Let's get away from what others believe and teach. Instead, let's make a very important distinction about this show. And, and the, the, you know, as I used to say in my college classes, the medium is not the message. I hate talking about us on the show, but tonight I think this is important. I gotta make this distinction about this show. When you hear something being taught on SOS, it's being taught because we truly and sincerely believe it. Always, no exceptions. And while Bill and Nancy and I are very imperfect people, we all make mistakes. We, on this show, the three of us make mistakes. We, we sin, we have things that we need to overcome, we have things that we need to repent of. Mm -hmm. While the three of us are very imperfect, the one thing you can't ding us on, you will never ever hear any doctrinal hypocrisy on this show. Anything you hear that's being taught on SOS, it's taught solely because we believe it with all our hearts. In other words, 
you will never have to be concerned about our refraining from teaching something that we sincerely believe, refraining because we're worried about getting into trouble with others within some church corporation. Or losing our salary or our liquor or license. Or losing our salary, which we don't have any, or because we're afraid of losing, as you said, our liquor license. That's right. And that's a joke. We, always, we don't have a liquor license, but we always say that. We're not afraid of alienating our donors. We don't have any donors. That's right. As you know, on SOS, we're not in the business of generating new members. We're not interested in adding to our mailing list or gaining new followers. We don't have any of that stuff. Instead, instead of being worried about money coming in or increasing our membership or adding to our mailing list, our singular goal is to point people to Jesus. Our goal is never to point people to our group because we have no group. But let's do a caveat. When people contact us and ask us where we might suggest that they could attend Sabbath services in the area where they live, mm -hmm. we send people to other church groups. We, do. we don't have any church we groups. Have we, we have to. We have to. We don't have a church. So we send people out and we say, well, let's see, there's this group over here and this one's not too far. From. And many times, <laughs> these church groups are the very groups that can't stand SOS and they're constantly trying to keep their people from watching our show. Mm. It's beautiful. We love it. All right, back to our point. <laughs> Getting you to follow us and support us is not our goal. We put on this show every Friday evening as a service to you, a service to you, to give you a place to go to at the beginning of the Sabbath where we can talk about the Bible and Christian principles and doctrine and history and all this fun stuff. A place where we can laugh and yuck it up and enjoy ourselves. A place where we can assemble electronically in Christian love with other like-minded Sabbath keepers. And we're very unapologetic that we proclaim that we're Sabbath keepers, even though we got a lot of Sunday keepers who watch the show. And one of the reasons that the Sunday keepers like our show is because we never say, well, if you don't keep the seventh day Sabbath, you're gonna burn in hell. We never say that. Or we don't say, if you're not a seventh day Sabbath keeper, you're not a Christian. Or if, if you don't keep the seventh day Sabbath, you're not in the true church. We leave that kind of judgment to Jesus. We preach that the Sabbath should be kept. We teach obedience to the law. But then when it comes time, time for the final judgment as to who makes it into the kingdom of God and who doesn't, that's not up to us. That's up to Jesus. So we stay away from that. We don't condemn people who don't agree with us in our religion. So if a person benefits from our teaching, fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. But if a person gets mad at us, he can move on. And if he wants to go on to a bunch of corporate church forums and talk smack about SOS, that's fine. We have absolutely no problem with that. No. And some, someone says, well, yeah, you gotta say that. No, 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 I'm not just blowing, blowing smoke. I mean it when I say it's fine if someone wants to get mad at us and go bad-mouthing us in other places. Here's why it's not an issue to us. Let, let me explain. Let's talk about King David. You know, it seems like most of the time in Church of God, somebody who wants to bring up King David is to justify sex sins okay <laughs> oh yeah our minister he we got caught it he got caught in adultery and king david just, just like know, david all right yeah. but we're, we don't do that on this show okay let's talk about another aspect of david other than the fact that you know he had some sex things going mm -hmm. on okay david was not some gentle guy who sat around writing music and poetry some dreamy-eyed guy putting all this stuff together so that we could have the book of psalms to read today he wasn't just that guy. Anyway. No, he, wasn't. he was that guy, but he was more than that. David was a bloody man. He was a brutal man, and I'm not saying that's good. I'm just stating a fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, David killed all kinds of people. It was nothing for David to go into battle and slay hundreds of people. I mean, Tens of thousands, right? Uh, uh, Saul killed his thousands, David's his tens of thousands. Okay, did, did you rather to read the script because you would have seen that, that was coming up, okay? <laughs> yeah, we find that in 1 Samuel 18, 7, how King Saul was furious that the women in Israel would dance around singing these words, Saul has killed his hundreds, but David has killed his thousands. Remember that? These women sang that little ditty because bloodshed was a big, big part of David's life. He was really good at killing. But then with all this brutality and killing that were part of David, we read about this fascinating incident that took place when David was once again at war. And I think this, I think, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this was the last time David was at war. It's in 2 Samuel 16.5. Write that down, please. 2 Samuel 16.5. And here we have a situation where David is on the run 
because his son Absalom is trying to pull off a royal coup d'etat. Absalom is trying to overthrow King David and take his place on the throne of Israel. And at this point in the rebellion that we're seeing in 2 Samuel 16, Absalom seems to be winning that war. It's not looking real good for David. David's now running for his life when we come across him in this passage of 2 Samuel 16.5. And we read here that David, while on the run, while this is, he's, he's taken off and trying to flee, some Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin, and the guy's name is Shimei, he approaches David and starts cussing him out. Shimei is calling David all kind of names. He's saying to David, you're on the run because you're a murderer, and I hope your son kills you. He says David's brought all this suffering on himself because he's an evil person. And, and when he's doing this, Shimei is actually throwing rocks at David. He's actually picking up big old piles of dirt and throwing them on David. Well, naturally, one of David's loyal bodyguards said to David, you give me permission and I'll go slice that guy up. I'll cut off his head. And bloody David says, nah. God says, David says, it's just possible that God sent Shimei, Shimei to curse me. David says that if that's the case that God sent him, then I've got no business killing him or having him being killed for doing the will of God. So David and his soldiers continued on their way, permitted Shimei to curse them, throw rocks at him, throw dirt on him. If you feel you have the role of Shimei and that it's your job to curse me for what I teach on this show, who am I to condemn you for your actions? If there's even the slightest chance that you're doing it because God inspired you to do it, I'm not going to raise my hand against you. I'm not going to respond in kind. I only have one defense in what I preach. I've already said it. And that is that on this show, we teach what we really believe. There's never any hypocrisy in our teachings. We're never going to teach something because it's necessary to maintain our income. We never teach something because we need to gain new members or because we're afraid of losing the members we have. Again, we don't have any income. We don't have any members. We don't have a mailing list. Again, anything we do on Start Our Sabbath is done because we believe it's the right thing to do. And if our teaching enrages you, so be it. May God's peace be upon you. Because at that point, when you go into your rage, it's between you and God, and I've got no part of it. At that point... Bill and Nancy and I are just going to keep moving ahead in our service to God's ecclesia. As always, please feel free to talk to us in the chat room. As you know, we love your comments and questions. We love hearing from you, even if you disagree with us. And especially if you disagree and show love at the same time. Hint, hint, hint. Okay, Nancy, what have you got in the chat room for us tonight? Okay, um... Not much going on in YouTube, but uh, maybe it's my computer on and off. I don't know. Um, okay, so Will of Love Al says, uh, Amen, Wesley, uh, work on our race. Diane Partridge says, each individual should read and study and grow in understanding and faith. Mm -hmm. uh, Xavier St. Hope uh, points out uh, David and Goliath and how Saul saw him there and uh, selected David at that point. After he saw David kill somebody very effectively mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then cut off the, the, the giant's head. Mm -hmm. Standing there holding his huge head as a trophy. Um, Will of Love Al also uh, points out that we should, it says, judge not that we shall be not judged. Jen Tarter says, mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Wes. Great show, everyone. Um, uh, Ed Joy Gonzalez Palumbo says, anybody wanted, uh, oh, sorry. I'd have to go back the other direction figure out what they're talking about. There's a conversation. Uh, Bill says using every headline, uh, headline theology is using every headline to make a prophecy connection and use for marketing purposes. So in case anybody was wondering what the de de definition of headline theology is. Mm -hmm. uh, Willow Love Al says we're the bride, the, we're the bride of tri Christ in reaction to John Black saying church organizations are not the church of God. That's right. The body is. Yeah, but the, but the people that are in the church organizations can very well be uh, members of the Church of God. Okay. So, we're, And we're not saying that any time you're in a church organization, you're not in the body of Christ. We don't say that. No, I think he's just saying that. I know he's not, okay. but I'm just making okay. a, a clarification in case someone says, 
oh yeah, Wes White's against church organizations, and he, because some people will tell you, if you join one of the COG organizations, you're no longer in the church, you've just moved out of the body of Christ, we don't say that, we have no idea, if you take a church organization here, how many of them are in the body of Christ, are in the ecclesia, are true Christians, we don't know, none of our business, or that organization, that's not our job. We're not against church organizations. They have a purpose. Okay. Yeah. Carl says, good show. I think uh, Solomon later killed the guy that cursed David after he left Jerusalem while he's commanded to stay in Jerusalem or die. I remember that. So the deal that Solomon made with this Shimei was you can come eat at my table, but you or you can, you can I'm not going to kill you, but you, if you, the, in the day you leave Jerusalem, then I'm going to kill you. Don't leave Jerusalem. <laughs> And he left for some reason. I can't remember. Yeah. Somebody do something. Yeah. Else, lost something and went after it. Whatever. But I think you're. I think you're right. And somebody. Can Thank you, Carl. Fact check that. Yeah. Right? Thanks, Carl. Um. All right. Uh, Charles Roberts says hello and happy Sabbath from Central Iowa. Make sure I didn't miss anybody else who is here. Um, there are comments that uh, people liked uh, my message and Bill's. You're you're welcome. Thank you for being with us. Uh, that's my response to what they said. And again, the fact that you're here, we thank you for it because it's our privilege to serve you. You're doing us a favor by being here on this show. Um, we're not doing you a favor. You're doing us a favor. We're very grateful to be able to serve you. Thank you for being part of the show. Okay. Right, and Amy says that Bill is still her favorite German. I'm offended by that, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> is Wes your favorite Polish person? Yeah, and, and I'm sure Carl Nachtrieb is also uh, offended by that statement. So be careful, Amy. Watch yourself, girl. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of Germans here, so... <laughs> All right, let's see if we've got any um, other comments specifically. If we miss your comment, it's because Nancy's trying to scroll on her phone and, and find them. She doesn't want to miss any. She's not deliberately ignoring you. It's just that sometimes it's hard for her to find the comments. That's true. So. Okay. Um, we're all to be servant leaders, so I'm going to let it go with that. Uh, I read Okay. I read YouTube. Anything in YouTube? No, nope, I already read that. So. Okay. All right, I think all right. we're good for now. All right. Uh, so we're going to be back next week. Do we know what we're talking about next week? Do we? Have I any? do not know what I'm talking about. That's what the Sabbath is for tomorrow. I kind of have an idea. It's about the other brother um, to the, um, uh, no, I forgot. Okay. The Did prodigal it? son, the other brother. Okay. So, uh, uh, if Bill, you're in the chat room. If you know what you're going to talk about, you can mention. But we will be here, God willing. Uh, next Friday night at 8 o'clock Central Time. Um, and uh, hopefully we've got this whole headline theology and end time prophecy totally behind us. Hopefully we've cleaned up all the loose ends and we can start a whole new fight. I mean, a whole new conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, we can. And so, I'm just kidding. do you know what you're talking about next week? I have no idea. No? No. no you, I, know, you have like 20 things, I'm sure, written down. Yeah. I, yeah, I have this thing called the perpetual topic uh, thing. It's a Word document, and it's got just all kind of stuff in there that yeah, I want to talk about. you some things you've been wanting to go through for a while. Yeah, a lot of times I'll put something in the script on a Monday, and Tuesday something else will come up, and I have to move what I had into the perpetual file and say I'm going to use it later, and then I end up not using it, it and it's gone forever. It's a forever, good problem so. to have. Yeah. Uh, Diane Partridge says, Thank you, Wes, for speaking about the various COGs. There shouldn't be the bashing and speaking against, as we are all part of the body of Christ. I also know that God works with us as individuals yes. collectively, yes. but the individuals make up the groups. But topic, uh, as some have mistaken idea, uh, good topic or big topic, as some have mistaken ideas about small groups. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're not against small groups. We're not against the big corporate COGs. We're not against them all. Uh, and, and as uh, Diane said, um, everybody in everybody in those groups, even the ones that get furious with it. And a lot of people watch us week after week because they don't like what we're preaching. And they sit there and get mad and steam comes out of their ears. Well, we don't and, know that for sure. Yeah, we do because we get reports on it all the time. But God loves every one of uh, these people, whether they're watching the show and they're mad or watching the show and they, they love what's going on. Because we can't all agree on everything. Uh, there's so much, we're such imperfect carnal humans and we can't have perfect understanding of scripture we're going to have differences 
And when we have these differences, sometimes people are going to get mad. And I confess, years ago, when someone had a doctrinal difference with me, I would get mad and say, well, they're not called. They were never converted in the first place, and, and they're doing evil by preaching this. And, and, and I had to outgrow that. And, and I, I, I've come to understand that God loves every one of these people uh, in the ecclesia. He loves all of us. He called all of us for the purpose of being reborn into the family of God so that we could all live with him forever in the kingdom of God. So God loves all these people. And that's and, and because of the love that we have for all these people out there, it makes it so much easier to overlook when somebody gets mad and starts, you know, calling you names or going on some forum out there and saying, I gotta warn you about West White, he's evil. So it, it's all good. We love everybody and no hard feelings. Okay, anything else? No? Nancy's checking uh, Mary one last Young time. Perkins says, not everyone is going to agree on everything, just listen and learn. And we'll love outfits, study to show our approval, ourselves approved. Yeah, and, and one final thought, and then I'll end this because we've gone a little over time, instead of like last week when we went a lot of overtime. But um, brethren, we really need to understand conflict resolution. We've got to be able to disagree in love, and that's just the first, first part of it. When we disagree, we've got to love each other. And when the time is right, in the right circumstance, we've got to learn how to resolve these conflicts by sitting down and talking with each other calmly and civilly and, and uh, in, in, in Christian love, uh, agape love, phileo love. We, we've got to be able to do that. And that's so lacking in so many Christians that they can't sit down and say, come, let us reason together. Mm -hmm. And, and I know there are people in the church uh, over the years that have gotten mad at me about something. And I said, can I come over and can we please talk it out? And, and, and I promise I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to raise my voice. I mean, you're the one that's mad, not me. But can we talk about it? And if you want to yell at me, that's fine. I'm willing to be yelled at. But they won't even let you come over and talk to them. And there are people out there right now that uh, don't want us doing the RLDEA.com, the Ron Dart Evangelistic Association, and I really would like to sit down and talk to them and say, we're your friends. We should be working together as a team. And they're like, no, we refuse to talk to you. Not going to happen. And brethren, that's not good conflict resolution. Christians need to understand how to handle conflict resolution. Because what did Jesus say? Didn't Jesus say the one sign that people will know you are mine is if you keep the Sabbath perfectly. That's didn't he exactly say that? exactly what he said. No, he didn't say that. That's not what he said. Did, did Jesus say, I, I think he said this maybe, the one sign that everyone will know you are mine is that you have perfect doctrinal understanding. Isn't that what he, no, that's not what he said. Jesus said the one sign that people will know that you are mine is if you have love for one another. Mm -hmm. So let's start showing love for one another, not giving lip service by just, you know, talking the talk, but we got to walk the walk, brother. We got to have love for one another. So make yourself a committee of one to always have love for other people, mm -hmm. to always say, look, if we got a problem, let's see if there's any way we can work this out and, and, and be doers of conflict resolution. Exactly. Okay. Okay, a couple more comments okay. and we got to go. John Black says, Wes, I agree with you regarding organizations, but many believe they are the church. If you leave yeah. the organization, you left the church of God. Exactly. Uh, let me put a name in on what John Black just said. Okay. There, well, there is no church organization, no 501c3 that can make the claim we are the true church and nobody else in other church organizations is the true church. That doesn't exist the true church is not a 501c3 church corporation. And the reason I'm so adamant about it, it's like, it's like a former drunk who gives up alcohol and he really comes down on booze, or a former smoker. He, he really can't stand being around people who smoke because he gave it up and he realizes the evils of it. I was one of the biggest believers in that I was the one true church and everybody that was not in it was not in the, in the, church, in the body of Christ. And if you left that organization that I was in, you just took yourself out of the kingdom of God. And if you died tomorrow, you would not be resurrected into the kingdom of God. You'd probably end up in the lake of fire. 
I am horrified when I think about how I once believed that. So John Black, you're absolutely right. No one church organization can claim to be the true church of God. And another thing they can't claim is to be doing the work of God. I mean, so many people out there have said, we are doing the work. No, you're not. You're doing a work. All the Church of God people, are do, uh, the people in the ecclesia, are doing a work. No one is doing the one and only work. The only ones preaching to God. That's silliness. So thank you, John Black, for your comment. All right, what else you got? Okay, there? and Bill Brett said that uh, if you're looking for a group in Portsmouth, um, Ohio, here's a, a URL for that. Uh, Melissa Chandler says uh, ideas on topic, spiritual widows and widowers, and tears in the church. So write those down, Mike. What, what are the, what is that again? I didn't catch uh, that. Spiritual widows and widowers and tears in the church. What about them? Uh, ideas for topics. Oh, idea. Oh, ideas for topics for yes. us. Okay, yes. widows and widowers in the church, and what's the other one? Tears in the church. Tears. Oh my. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Let, let me write that down. We we got to add that to the list. Tares and widows and widowers. Okay. Thank uh, you. Larry Evans admits also that he's been there, done that with the one and only true church idea. Yep. And uh, John Black says, a lot of us did. It's exactly what we were fed and we believed to it. And Mary Young Perkins says, amen to Wes. Uh, Michael McCarty said, now I can totally agree with that comment, Wes. I'm not sure exactly which one, but it was when you were ranting about these Okay, things. one of my rants he agreed with. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Michael. All right, uh, Amy Hohurst says, God ain't got time for hypocrisy, and that is the truth. Very good. He wants, he wants us honestly. Okay. Um, all right, so I think we're good, and uh, are we ready to wrap this up with prayer? Yeah, let's close with prayer. If you all bow your heads, please. Our Father in, God, our Father in Heaven... We are so grateful to you for your love that you give to us. We thank you for the love that was manifest here tonight uh, on this show. Um, on this show where we don't claim to be doing the work of God. It's just a small little itsy bitsy thing that we do. But we're so grateful to you that we can be part of this, uh, of this effort. We thank you that uh, people come on this show and uh, they comport themselves so lovingly and so kindly. We are so grateful for um, all of your people. Help us, Father, to overlook each other's faults. Help us to overlook when we don't agree with each other. Help us to always uh, use that one identifier, which is that we have love for one another. Help us to, to be on fire for doing your work and recognize that there are no passengers in the ecclesia. There are only crew members. So help us all to do your will. Help us all to be active in uh, promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the law of God. We thank you for the Sabbath day. We ask for your safety on those who will be traveling tomorrow, your obedient ones who are going to be assembling with one another. And we ask that you be there in all these church services around the world as people pray and study their Bibles and talk about the Word of God and fellowship and break bread together. So we ask your blessing on all your people around the world and we give you such great thanks. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for watching. See you next week. Uh, Eight o'clock Central Time. Mm -hmm. All right. So, In the meantime, so shall we flip on who has to go shut off the camera? No, I'll go do it. But first, we want to say, oh, have, have a, a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Yeah, I think we ought to cast lots. You know, we ought to flip a coin and Got a lucky pretend we're coin? talking about Matthias and casting lots. And you don't want to cast lots, okay? Yeah. I'm just kidding. We don't want to cast lots. Good night. See you next week. <laughs>